Okay, we are going to begin the last plenary panel of the day. We started out with television today. Now we're going to go back a bit. Uh, and here are some folks who are very well known for doing uh, television history. Uh, before I introduce the moderator, uh, I want to invite all of you, if you're bored tonight, uh, to a place where some of us might find some great Oregon beer, um, and it's called Tugboat Brewery, and it's, on, it's, it's off of Broadway, 7-Eleven Southwest Ankeny. So I'm going to let you find it. Some of us might find ourselves there around 8. We'll take over the place. Occupy Tugboat Brewery. <laughs> I'm really happy to introduce our moderator for this session, Carol Stabile from the University of Oregon. She has been a whirlwind of activity at the University of Oregon since she's been there, and I'm really excited that she's here at the conference participating. And Carol? Um, thank you, uh, and thank you, Janet, for inviting me to moderate this panel. Um, when Janet asked me to moderate this panel, I had a moment of panic. Um, it isn't every day that you get to introduce three scholars of, of their stature. Um, so I wrote a script so I wouldn't get nervous and verklempt and not be able to, to at least give you some sense of, of who they are and what their contributions have been. Um, and I'll try not to act like a, a fangirl. Um, <laughs> but I am. Uh, Michelle Helms is Professor of Media and Cultural Studies at the University of Wisconsin. Professor Helms' work spans the overlapping fields of broadcast history, television studies, sound studies, and new media. She's the author of numerous books and articles, including the groundbreak, groundbreaking Radio Voices, American Broadcasting 1922 to 1952, The Radio Reader, NBC, America's Network, and Only Connect, A Cultural History of Broadcasting in the United States. Um, Eileen Meehan is professor in the Department of Radio and Television at Southern Illinois University. Professor Meehan is a political economist specializing in media industries and commercial culture. She's the author of Why TV is Not Our Fault. She co-edited edited Sex and Money, Feminism and Political Economy in Media Studies with Ellen Reardon and also Dazzled by Disney, the Global Disney Audiences Project, which was co-edited with Janet Wasco and Mark Phillips. Her research has been published in major journals like Critical Studies in Media and Communication, International Journal of Media and Cultural Politics, and I could go on and on, but I'll stop. Um, Horace Newcomb holds the Lambden, the Lambden K Chair for the Peabody's and is director of the George Foster Peabody Awards Programs and professor of telecommunications in the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of Georgia. He is the author of TV, The Most Popular Art, co-author of The Producer's Medium, and editor of seven count em editions of television, The Critical Review. Um, his research and teaching interests are in media, society, and culture, and he's written wi widely in the fields of television criticism and history. Um, and I will uh, turn it over to our, our esteemed plenary speakers so I now. First. Can, how, oops. How's that? Is that better? Okay. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Carol. And thanks, Janet, very much for inviting me. It's uh, wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be on this panel with uh, Horace and Eileen. And um, it's been really interesting uh, so far, I have to say, what a nice mix of people from uh, all different kinds of approaches, methodologies, also industry and, um, and scholarship. So uh, I look forward to learning more uh, tomorrow. Um, it's kind of interesting when you're at a what is television to be sort of cast as, you know, the past. Like, are we like the ghost of television past? <laughs> you know, come back to haunt you, perhaps? <laughs> Um, but maybe what we'll do um, is to show some relevance, uh, some, some things about uh, television's past that hopefully will illuminate um, the present and what we're talking about. Now, uh, so I'm going to make an initial statement, which I think some people, you might, you, I can't see you, so you can go ahead and roll your eyes, <laughs> um, because a lot of people will expect me to say something like this, and also it might seem like something rather, you know, dusty and trite in a way, uh, something that perhaps was um, disproven long ago. But I'm looking at that question, what is TV? And what I want to say TV is, and this is going to be counterintuitive, is TV is radio with pictures. 
And I want to go back and talk about that in three ways. And it's interesting to me that, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the future of television. We're talking about digital media. We're talking about print media. We brought up film. I think I've heard radio mentioned twice and only in passing the whole time. And, of course, for me as a historian of broadcasting, I look at the history of television and I see, you know, most we start in the 19, maybe the late 40s, but the 50s. But of course, we all know that some of the basic decisions that set up the structures, the commercial model, the program forms, the practices, you know, vir virtually everything that led to television as we still know it today was set not in the 1950s, but in the 20s and 30s and 40s. Now, okay, fine, you know, there's the, the, the radio person going, study radio. Uh, okay, <laughs> now, you know, I've said that a million times. Um, but I want to show like what I can bring to this discussion, I hope, to get you to think about television differently by uh, looking at uh, its past in radio. And so I have three th notes that I'm going to sound, three themes or three ideas I want to get across about how looking at the period of uh, radio and, and the radio in general can help us think differently about television today. And the first one is dispersed, di <laughs> if I could say it, dispersed distribution. The second one is seriality, and the third is sound on screen, and I'll get to those in turn. I know that sounds mysterious. Okay, so but I better put my glasses on because I'll never be able to see my screen if I don't do that. Um, I want to point out, when it, when in talking about the first one, uh, dispersed distribution, that like so many things in the middle part of the 20th century, the model of television that most of us think of as the foundationary structure, the foundational structure in the 1950s is actually an anomaly. Because if we look back to the earlier period of the 20s and 30s, and now again in the digital era, what we see is a much more dispersed model of production, distribution, and reception than we ever had in the early days of television in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and not until the 80s. And that's because I'm getting a thumbs up from our hostess back there. Um, that's because, maybe it's not from me, but I like to think that it was. <laughs> um, it might not, okay, there we go. Um, because if you go back to the early models of radio broadcasting, I, I think a lot of histories that have emphasized the rise of the commercial networks, and yes, they did eventually rise to dominate the commercial system, neglect a lot of the very different ways that radio was produced and distributed back then. It neglects, first of all, the fact that radio stations increased in number from the 20s to the 40s from a handful, you know, a few hundred, to over a thousand, actually over 1,500 by the 40s. Uh, and that was a conscious decision, you know, on the part of regulators and industry to increase the number of stations that were out there. This meant that there was much more localized production and listening than has been captured in most historical accounts, including my own, because that's, it's very hard to document that, and that's what's been lost to history to a certain extent. There was also a far more dispersed production um, situation where the people that were producing radio were not the networks. They were, of course, the advertising agencies and sponsors, but they were independent producers situated all over the place. People like Erna Phillips, let's say, who you know is the mother of soap opera, who uh, in, was a commercial producer, had her own company produced in Chicago, and that was the, the norm for radio. And, and there was also uh, a very thriving, and here I would, I love Bob McChesney's uh, telecommunications book, but you know, his point was that, uh, one of his sort of side points was that educational radio was crushed. It was not crushed. Actually, educational radio thrived in the 1930s. There was a federal radio education commission that produced thousands of programs for the radio. And this is a history that's been a little bit concealed. No one has really written a history of that side of radio. Um, and partly they did that uh, through an affiliation with British Broadcasting Company, which is how I started to think about it recently with my most recent book that was about the BBC and the US interaction. So dispersed distribution is a characteristic of early radio. It's now become a characteristic of television in the digital era. And so if we think of television as radio, of early radio as you know television's prehistory, um, maybe we can learn some things about how dispersed distribution might work. The second element is seriality. And I'm lucky here because a lot of my points were made this morning, I thought, very eloquently um, by Bryce Zabel, I couldn't think of his last name, who was talking about binge TV. And you know, binge TV is serial TV. Seriality has been part of uh, broadcasting structure since radio. But what an amazing thing radio did in the 1920s and 30s for seriality. 
there had been serial media before, uh, notably, you know, newspapers, magazines, serial, and also books. Because even up until the beginning of the 20th century, you know, authors made far more money publishing their novels in magazines uh, and, and in other kinds of serial distribution. That was the, the, the tail that wagged the dog, if you will, and it wasn't until the early uh, 20th century that single novel publishing became you know, the dominant standard. So seriality was out there. But what broadcasting did was take it and raise it, you know, uh, by a you know a incredible uh, um, to, uh, percentage, and broadcasting became the place where serial forms could be developed and grow, not just in terms of soap operas and the kind of dramatic serials that we might think of as exhibiting the the um, highest forms of seriality, but also it, the serial structures of sports, as Michael Reel was pointing out this morning, of uh, news of any kind of uh, organized, periodic, recurring kind of serial structure, that is the backbone of broadcasting. And we take it for granted. We think, of course it was. It had to be, right? But actually, no. Uh, if you study the history of the British Broadcasting Corporation, you'll find that seriality was adamantly resisted there, that uh, radio did not become serialized at the BBC until the late 1930s uh, because of the preference for a model that was based more upon standalone um, more traditionally authored and respectable forms. So it's an it's a incredibly powerful uh, mode of expression. And so now I think what we're you know, t looking at is a, is a time when the difference between TV or whatever we want to call that and other media is long form versus short form media. I mean, we're now in the era of long form media. And why did radio choose that? to cement that ephemeral, that you know, incredibly ephemeral medium of sound into some form of predictability and recurrence that could uh, draw an audience, that could create a brand, that could create cohesion and glue uh, to hold this dispersed structure together. And that's exactly, I think, the, the point that we are now with digital media. And I think that you know, those uh, serialized forms are gonna become, uh, they are becoming just as important as they were back then. Excuse me a sec while I scroll down a bit. Okay, and then finally, and this might be the least, the most counterintuitive, I want to point out that we are in the era of the return of sound. I don't know how many people are radio junkies like I am. I spend much more time uh, listening to the radio than I do viewing things these days. And I don't know if you're aware that, you know, of, of many, of, of, you know, one sector of our um, our broadcast industry has been growing rather than shrinking, and that's public radio particularly. It's up in viewership, it's up in supporters, it is thriving and growing. What an incredible independent sound production industry there is out there now. You go on sites like transom.com or PRX, and I bet a lot of people who study TV have never heard of these sites. And there's just this outburst of creative independent work drama, documentary, things that fall in between, all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, and that's not just here, it's around the world, all over. Um, and also, um, podcasting, of course, has, has been a big field in its own right and also a mode of distribution that has helped this uh, independent production sector uh, rise. But how do we experience sound these days? Sound is a screen medium now. We experience sound through screens. We go on our computers, we go onto iTunes, we go onto these websites, we t our iPads, our iPods, our phones. This is how we're listening. Sound is a screen medium, and it's, uh, gonna, it's become integrated with visual, with text, as has television, uh, as have newspapers. You know, we see this convergence going on. With, between Newspapers have audio slideshows and videos, et cetera. So the, the return of sound as a screen medium, I think, is something that uh, is new, that is going to be increasingly incorporated into television practices, uh, and is something that we might um, uh, that we might be able to think about in a different way, uh, looking at the early days of radio. So to conclude, as I said, radio has pictures now, pictures have sound, and both of these are integrated with text and other forms of creative expression in a landscape that looks a lot more like early radio than it does the glory days of either, let's say, the studio system, to take that model, or the national networks. What is television? It is dispersed, long-form narratives combining sound, pictures, and text 
on screen interfaces. Radio with pictures. <laughs> Let me add my uh, appreciation for this conference and, and thanks to uh, Janet and, and her assistants for putting all this together and uh, bringing a lot of people together who might not ordinarily uh, speak to one another. Uh, it's, it's nice to have an occasion to, to do this kind of thing. It's also our first trip to Portland. Sarah so always travels with me when possible and uh, it's a lovely city. There's some dispute, I think, over whether it was first keep Portland weird or keep Austin weird, and I'm not <laughs> sure uh, which one, uh, but they can both claim it now. Um, I'm going to read this. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a late adopter. I, I, I've, I've, I've never done this before, and I forgot to print out a copy, and so if this sucker messes me up, I'll just have to make it up as I go. Um, so let me begin by saying that I've never really considered myself a historian. In part, this is because I'm sometimes puzzled about the usefulness of the enterprise. Of course, we all remember George Santayana's famous comment, which is often paraphrased differently, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Uh, this is usually offered as a reason for studying history and frequently by authors for writing it. My response, however, and I've come to this only lately in the last few years, is that those who do remember the past are also condemned to repeat it. <laughs> As the book of Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing new under the sun. And while we're comfortable with the familiar nothing new line, it's more difficult to read the earlier part of that sentence. What has been done is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. Or in another verse, that which is already has been, that which is to be already has been. It's, a, it's an humbling exercise. I, I read Ecclesiastes twice a year just to keep myself honest on that. But in fact, we've just heard uh, what has been done will be done. Uh, okay, back up a little. So far, I've not attempted to write anything substantial that I would call history because I, I fear the process could become endless and endlessly frustrating. Arranging and rearranging material one knows to be incomplete and always <coughs> skewed in some fashion. With all of these qualifications and reservations in mind, I can assume three reasons for being a designated historian for our purposes here. And the first is probably the most obvious. I'm old enough to remember the early days of television, <laughs> uh, especially the transition in my family circumstance, particularly from radio to television. Related to this is that I've been writing about television since the late 1960s, which makes things I wrote then look like history now. <laughs> Indeed, I've heard that TV, the most popular art, uh, can be used as a description, remember, flawed, partial, skewed, of television in the 1950s and 60s. Written between 1971 and 74 and published in late 74, the book does contain a good many descriptions and plot summaries that could be useful to others, assuming that they recognize that without the service of VHS, our DVR, our DVD, these summaries and descriptions were all written from my memory of these shows. Um, and, and yesterday I found this in Powell's. It's a, it's a pristine edition, uh, a pristine copy of TV, the most popular art, and I only have two at home, which are very uh, beat up. Now, the interesting thing is that when this book was published and for many years after, I've referred to it as the cheapest book in America. It sold for $2.50. Uh, I bought it at Powell's yesterday, not as, a, as an heirloom, I bought it at their regular price, used as it is, for $2.95. <laughs> uh, so uh, something, you know, it, it's either holding its value or something <laughs> is really messed up here. Uh, seven editions of television, The Critical View, from 1976 through 07, also contain many descriptions by others, as with the most popular art, contain many strong arguments about the programs described there. A second reason for my placement on this panel is likely the work done in editing the Museum of Broadcast Communications Encyclopedia of Television. With that effort, I learned from more than 300 authors that we had working with us around the world a great deal more history of the medium than I possessed. And the third reason is perhaps my present position with the Peabody Awards. In that capacity, I worked very closely with the archivist in the Walter J. Brown Media Archive and Peabody Awards Collection at the University of Georgia Library. 
The archive recently moved into a new state-of-the-art building where our fragile collection of film and video and audio and tape, CDs, DVDs, and now pods and hard drives receive the utmost care. And this is important because the Peabody television collection alone, not speaking of radio or other forms, holds more than 50,000 titles, with title often referring to a complete annual series of an entertainment program. This is the third largest television archive in the United States, following only the Library of Congress and UCLA's film and television archive. And I'll refer only to the television materials today, despite the presence of a massive radio collection. And I always make a point of mentioning it, although I'll talk a bit more about it today, because I really want more and more television and radio scholars to come and work in the archive. Uh, if we don't have a viewing copy, we'll try our best to have it made, although we've got 16 millimeter film stored in freezers bought from Sears to keep them from deteriorating. Uh, but it's now in this magnificent new special collections building which holds two other collections as well as the, uh, the media archive. It's truly a unique collection. It comprises works selected by producers, stations, networks, individuals as their most outstanding work from the previous calendar year. We are currently in the midst of evaluating more than a thousand entries for the year 2011. The entries come in all forms from entertainment to public service, documentary, children's programming, news, information, and so on. And though the award is not given in categories, we ask people to submit so that they will have, we will have it for administrative purposes. The archive undoubtedly holds the most extensive archive of a collection of, U, of local U.S. television programming in the country. The bulk of these local works are from news organizations, but we also hold early children's and local children's and educational programs, teen dance programs from the 1950s and 60s, local documentaries, and the Peabody Archive is a treasure for social and cultural historians seeking mediated materials to complement other sources. But in many ways, it's also a history from 1940 to the present of broadcasting, cable distribution, and lately webcasting. Uh, the award was created in 1940 uh, by the NAB and the University of Georgia. Uh, it is the oldest award for electronic media in the world. Uh, several years ago, I was a judge at Capri Italia, and the, the uh, director of the program, Carlo Sartori, came off the stage and said, said uh, we're the oldest award for electronic media in the world. And when Carlo came off the stage, I just kind of pulled him aside and said, look, I know there were other things going on here in 1940, but, you know, we were started then, so that's, uh, some of you will get that reference and some not. Um, the great major majority of the holdings are U.S. in origin, but it's also international in scope, with more and more international entries each year. And drawing on some of the uh, aspects of the collection, I now finally, and you may be saying, ad address our topic, what is television? Uh, I've puzzled over this question for many years now, since the seams of the three, four if you count public television, began to stretch and unravel. Uh, the coming of Fox and the first slow, then explosive expansion of cable offerings shattered my notion of a coherent television system. When Paul Hirsch and I published Television as a Cultural Forum, Implications for Research in 1983, we assumed we had adequately, though certainly not sufficiently, described and defined television. The article was meant as a response, a challenge in some ways, to what we considered narrow and incomplete explanations. The premise was simple. Television programming and content are more complicated, and we're talking largely about entertainment television, more complex than political economy, effects research, the Frankfurt School, American culture critics like Dw Dwight McDonald believed are demonstrated. And though I flee from audience research even more swiftly <laughs> than from history, we asserted that audiences make many meaning meanings from the meanings offered in television content, and we left it to our colleagues to prove that. Now, none of this should be taken as abandoning the contributions of political economy or the Frankfurt School or other critics, though it may be more of a challenge to direct effects research. We tried hard to make it clear that all this complexity and freedom operated within political and economic constraints. We referred to television as a central storytelling medium for culture and society, what David Thorburn refers to as consensus narrative. But consensus doesn't mean uncritical, without ambiguity, without means of questioning conventions and practices. Rather, it suggests the presence of multiple perspectives, bound together yet simultaneously challenged. In our view at that time, it was precisely this commonly available, commonly known set of arrangements, economic, social, and cultural, that defined television. 
the what is question had not come to the fore. What happens then when the forum is shattered, when there are multiple fora, each addressing more specifically defined viewers, when there are more and more distribution channels, some define more and more appealing to viewers by ideology than by anything commonly shared. To some degree, these developments drive the questions before us. Yet this new, fragmented, and segmented version of television is developing in tandem with other interesting features. Somewhat paradoxically, it is now easier than ever to consider the history of television, particularly television program content. Much of what of that history is now no longer exclusively in the past. Much of what we so easily refer to as ephemeral is with us, at hand, easily accessed. We have Hulu, we have nostalgia sets of DVDs, we have many forms of illegal downloads. I appreciate all of these. I can now check in some cases to see if the memories I used in the most popular art were relatively accurate. <laughs> Among the most important of these resources for me are services used by local television station digital ancillary channels. Various groups have realized that there's money to be made with history. Enlarging and in some ways reinventing the syndication model, Retro TV, Me TV, and other services make available a substantial range of earlier programming. WSB in Atlanta, and for those of you who don't know the history of radio, you should know that the call letters mean things. Uh, WSB means Welcome South, brother, uh, and it's still used uh, today. Uh, but WSB offers me much of what I still consider my television. This is the programming that started my fascination with scholarly concerns and, with, and was largely devoted to primetime entertainment TV. This is the programming that led to arguments that this is the most significant storytelling invention ever conceived, a means of storytelling that shatters the Aristotelian dictum that all good stories have beginnings, middles, and ends, because television programs, like as, as, as Michelle pointed out, following radio, serialized, don't have to end. Every producer's <laughs> dream for a time, but now I think they've realized that there is wisdom in conclusions. In his seminal 1976 essay, uh, David Thorben told us that the system of reruns constitutes a museum of sorts. That museum, that archive, is now exponentially expanded. But how do we understand that history? How do we use it as history? How do, what does it suggest for us as an answer to what is television? One of my all-time personal favorite television programs, one I've written about, one that exemplifies some features suggested in the forum model is Route 66. Uh, most of you don't know what that was. It was a program about two guys in a Corvette driving around America, sponsored by Chevrolet. <laughs> uh, uh, and they thought it would never go, but Chevy did, and they bought it. Um, and they were not so much heroes or even central characters as narrative agents. They would show up in a town and something would happen to people there, and they would learn something about it and occasionally help people resolve problems and then drive away. The series ran from 1960 to 1963 with 116 episodes. This is the days when people knew how to make TV. <laughs> Almost all were written by co-creator Sterling Siliphant. Almost all were shot on location in 25 different states. And you can imagine moving the, move the film crews to shoot 116 episodes over three years. Silivant was proud of his creation. He described it as, quote, a show about a statement of existence closer to Sartre or Kafka than anything else. Uh, a tad pretentious, but <laughs> in my view, in my view, he was right on. Uh, with considerably less con congratulation, but equal enthusiasm. Mark Alvey in his article on the, on the show in the Encyclopedia of Television says, the unrest at the core of the series echoed that of the Beats, especially Jack Kerouac's On the Road, of course, and anticipated the even more disaffected searchers of Easy Rider. If we study this single program as part of a history project, what strategies are in order? We can examine episodes of Route 66 to study issues and treatments of issues, television aesthetics of a particular sort, and so on. But we can also examine the show in the context of other television programming of its time, the schedule. The series ranked number 30 in its first year, 1960, with a 21.7 rating. Gunsmoke was number one 
at 37.3, uh, eat your heart out cable programmers. <laughs> Between the two were many westerns. Another of, my, another of my favorites, Have Gun, Will Travel, was number three. The Andy Griffith Show was number four. Ed Sullivan, The Flintstones, What's My Line were scattered in the top 30. Route 66 didn't show up in 61, 62, but The Defenders, a major legal series that covered every aspect of social justice issues, was at number 26 with a 22.4 rating. Sing Along with Mitch was at number 15, tied with Lassie. Uh, Route 66 showed again at number 27 in the 62-63 season. We can now examine many of these programs in, with, with all of the available material uh, in a manner that would allow for far greater richness of our analyses, more complexity and subtlety than the textual analyses of an earlier period. We have more details. We have machines that will allow us to, quote, read closely moving forward and backward, a, a, a luxury none of us had in the earlier days. What does Route 66 mean and tell us about what television meant in the context of the schedule to examine this history? But consider now another mode of comparison. If I turn to the online catalog of the Peabody Awards archive, which is available, by the way, in the university library, I can search by year and retrieve 198 titles broadcast in 1960 that were submitted for review. Each program described with at least some minimal information and some with a great deal. I find documentaries, news programs, specials, entertainment pro work, children's programming, the bulk of it at that time from local stations. It's academic from WRC-TV in Washington. Communist expose from WKCT in Miami. Focus Berlin from the USIA. Baseball's Greatest Dynasty from KPIX in San Francisco. Ben Casey, a network entertainment program. Uh, doctor program, a single episode called A Certain Time of Darkness from ABC, The Bullwinkle Show from NBC, <laughs> Bell and Howell Close Up Walk in My Shoes from ABC, probably a Robert Drew uh, production, but I didn't look it up, The Eichmann Trial from WABC in New York, General Electric Theater, The Dropout from CBS. We could examine Route 66 and perhaps the entire primetime series, but we would still be touching only on a small slice of what was available to viewers. But the Peabody Archive expands that beyond what we find in primetime compendia. These comparisons capture certain elements, offer material for comparative analysis, provide insight into industry, industry structures and strategies, even into notions and definitions of quality. But is that all there is to history? Is that all there is to context? Does that tell us what television was, or is, or has become? So I'll conclude with another form of the past. As I did when first writing about the medium, I continue to rely on memory. I consider history to be memory tutored, educated, analyzed, polished, smoothed over. Therein lies the great value of history. It enables us to see more clearly. But I also continue to appreciate the other personal, angular, flawed, blurred, myopic me features of memory. So it may be difficult to describe for you, for you to understand what a television program like Route 66 might have meant to a group of high school seniors in a small high school in Mississippi in 1960. It was a group that was reading Kerouac and listening to Dylan, but also to Stravinsky and to Dave Brubeck's quartet's Take Five are more often arguing the relative merits of Blue Rondo a la Turk over Take Five, watching Peter Gunn, another very hip and cool show, also going to the movies and seeing La Dolce Vita along with other common fare, as well as watching Route 66. And all of that caught up in the awful swirl of the civil rights movement taking place outside our doors and also the emergence of the other great historical event that marked our lives from that time forward. In the Peabody Archive, I find 52 items dealing with Vietnam submitted for review between 1962 and 1969, including one already entitled The Twenty-Year War. In 1963, one of the original stars of Route 66 left the show following a dispute with the network. He was replaced by a character who portrayed a Vietnam veteran. Remember, 1963. In his introductory episode, he experienced, in a very violent manner, a manner we would now recognize as realistic, what we today refer to as post-traumatic stress syndrome. Vietnam, 1963, 
entertainment television, PTSD. So far as I can term determine, and I haven't made an exhaustive search, this is the earliest commentary on the war in an entertainment series. In his essay on the show in the encyclopedia, Mark Alvey goes on, the show's rejection of domesticity in favor of rootlessness formed a rather startling counterpoint to the dominant primetime landscape of home and family in the late 1960s, as did the majority of the characters they encountered on the road. The more hopeful dimension of Route 66 coincided with the optimism of the New Frontier circa 1960, with these wandering Samaritans symbolic of the era's new spirit of activism. Premiering at the dawn of a new decade, Route 66 captured in a singular way the nation's passage from the disquiet of the 1950s to the turbulence of the 1960s, expressing a simultaneously troubled and hopeful vision of the United States. This is an adequate though partial description of the worlds in which those high school seniors viewed Route 66, then talked about it along with cult other cultural artifacts, sports, girls, in their homeroom hours. Activism, turbulence, disquiet, hope, trouble. For some, though not all of us, the shattering of domesticity, the need to wander, would become a defining characteristic of lifelong consequences. But I want to suggest with all of these things, these points of entry into a single television program, or for that matter, into the schedule, or the network, or a cable system, or the corporations that monitor and seek unsuccessfully, in my view, to control creative work in television. And to answer the question is, is that to answer the question that brings us here, we must examine very closely the personal, social, and cultural arrangements made possible by whatever we call television. And this goes back to Graham Turner's work on the moral economy of television systems. Those conditions vary historically to some degree. They vary among individuals. They even vary within individuals. For we may always have had multiple ways of viewing and living with television individually. Today, those ways may be multiplied yet more fiercely, varying from screen to screen, connection to connection. Mark Alvey's comments on the show, commented above, are a substantive though partial account of what memory can bring to the surface. But it is what remains below the surface that might best define television, certainly from the perspectives of history. I've tried to suggest that I once thought I knew what television was, because I have at times been able to articulate some of these sedimented features. What has been, what is, and what will be is a set of deep connections forged with the medium in all its forms by individuals and by groups. And only when we understand those relationships at every stage and every level, from individual to system to social and cultural formation, will, will we be able to say what television is. And our answer will very likely last for only a short time. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. It is an honor to speak with you. I'm especially pleased to address television's history today because history in general is making a major comeback in public discourse because of the Republican primaries. <laughs> Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum have been the most active invokers of our history, which they characterize as being comprised by a limited number of immutable facts that can be interpreted in only one way. Those interpretations cohere into a few specific lessons, like don't tax billionaires. And these lessons could be easily taught at schools if only teachers weren't unionized and if college professors were cloned from Newt Gingrich. <laughs> I bring up this vision of television as known, immutable, easily translated into simple lessons because it is so alien to anyone who has done historical research. I'm going to briefly discuss this vision in terms of two in terms of television's history, addressing in turn the notion that television history is comprised by a limited number of immutable facts, that these facts can be interpreted in a single way. And finally, that we can articulate simple lessons that have universal and eternal validity. So let's start with immutable facts and making a distinction between what happened in the past and what we know about 
what happened in the past. To date, no one seems to have invented a time machine, so I'm willing to concede that the past might actually be fully past and immutable. However, what we know about the past is different from the past itself, and that is one of the things that makes television's past so interesting. We are constantly discovering more facts. These new facts must be put in relationship with old facts. Can we integrate the new and the old? If so, why and how? If not, why not? How not? As we re-examine what we know about some aspects of television's past in light of new facts, we look for nuances, connections, disconnections, implications. In this sense, the history of television is constantly being discovered. It is important to note here that historical research on television takes different approaches, among them social history, cultural history, political economic history. This means that the constant discovery of fact, of fact occurs in terms of different emphases, different foci, which means that the constant discovery of television's past is more accurately phrased as a constant discovery of multiple aspects of television's pasts. This is far from the notion of a limited number of immutable facts that constitute the stuff of television history. From those points about discovery and research focus, it logically follows that no single interpretation will cover all of the facts. A political economic analysis of the history of the national ratings industry tells us nothing about how people live with television at different points in times, nor should it. The questions that drive social history are not the same as the questions that drive political economy, nor should they be, and ditto for cultural studies. Without a single limited body of facts and without a single unified interpretation, the chances for one or two pithy lessons from television's past are just about nil. But I think that at least three lessons can be drawn from my comments. First, as a phenomenon, television operates as a social, culture, and political economic institutions. Hence, when we take a singular approach, we may illuminate one aspect of the phenomenon of television. But we do not capture its complexity. Second, if we have an interest in understanding the phenomenon in its complexity, then more interdisciplinary work is needed. Third, Given what I've heard here today, it would behoove us to pursue such interdisciplinary research because television, defined as the transmission of images across dis distances, is going to have a very long past indeed, starting as of this past second. <laughs> I began my remarks by noting the idea that history of a history that is being championed by Newt Gingrich and Rick Santorum. I think it's only fair to end with a quotation from another member of the Republican Party. Uh, this is a quotation which I have taken out of context, but which I believe to be apropos because it reminds us of things we have, things we need to do, and things we are still seeking unknowingly. And I quote, there are known knowns. <laughs> there are things that we know we know. <laughs> we also know that there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. <laughs> but there are also unknown unknowns. <laughs> <laughs> there are things we do not know we don't know. <laughs> I thank former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld for his contribution to our study of the history of television's past. <laughs> Let us go forward. Let us know what we know. Let us find out what we don't know that we know. And let us find out the unknown unknowns that are unknown to us that we don't know yet. <laughs> I will be pleased to accompany you on that journey. Thank you.
And th thanks to our very well-disciplined speakers, we have plenty of time for discussion. So I'll wander around with the mic. George Bush picked people who could only talk as well as he could. <laughs> I don't know if, yeah. Uh, a self-interested question for Horace, Horace Newcomb. Uh, Peabody Awards, are they available to non-US citizens? <laughs> yes, it is an international award. We, yeah. Great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but we've never given more than 38 awards in a single year, and uh, this year we have 1,050 entries, so it's, it's tough for everybody, including the US citizens. Well, as you might expect, I'm going to come with a technology question. Um, we look at the pioneers, the people who initially gave us TV. You have people like um, uh, Sarnoff at uh, uh, RCA that gave us NBC as a way to sell more TVs. Today we have a number of other companies ranging from uh, Apple to Google that are looking for new ways to uh, sell their product. To what degree do you think that uh, understanding TV is as much about understanding these the corporate pursuit of profit as it is about understanding what uh, the viewers want, uh, the community, uh, the importance of news, et cetera. Is that for all of us? Everybody? Whoever wants to take it. I think you should take it, Heidi. I think I should take it too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think I should take it because this is, to me, um, my, one of the centers of my own research. Uh, I'm interested in the way that governments and corporations in capitalist countries come together to create platforms for these things to happen. Uh, running with everything from uh, intellectual property and patent laws uh, into governmental supports for specific kinds of markets like the uh, governmental control and regulation of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum that is then given free uh, to people to go make money on as opposed to renting it to companies to go make money on. Uh, I think those are really crucial things because in the particular systems of commercial television in capitalist countries, we're going to see a different kind of articulation about what television really does, what viewers count and what viewers you can throw away because advertisers don't want them, uh, and what sorts of stories can be told because they're cheap, they hit the target, uh, and they're easy to run through the system. To me, those are the crucial things uh, when we approach television as a part of an entertainment inf information sector in a larger capitalist economy that is integrated into a world economic system that is based largely on profiteering. Now, that said, I love Dog the Bounty Hunter. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, I love the way that show is organized. You got the sermon in the van. You've got redemption at the end. You've got the happy family that was fighting in the beginning of the show. The, the articulation of internal conventions to transform these people who look like they're from a Mad Max movie <laughs> into the ideal 1950s family strikes me as fabulous, fascinating. Uh, I enjoy talking to people who find that program to be of significance to them. And it's interesting to me how the program has different kinds of significances depending on who you're talking to. And if we think about ourselves not simply as individuals but as members of social collectives and as people who are organized in a social economic hierarchy, then those individual testimonies take on a special relevance, a special kind of connectedness for us to understand this stuff that is circulated to us almost universally at least with in the middle class and up. Uh, and that is presented as our window in the world and our, our mirror of us and our feelings, and which is driven completely by economic, economic motives and political concessions to political powers. That contradictory vision of a television system is the one that strikes me as worthy of, one of the ones that strikes me as worthy of research, worthy of our time, worthy of our explication so that we can see television, not simply as the box or the screen or NBC Universal or Dog the Bounty Hunter, but as this complicated phenomenon 
that we can take apart and understand. And because we can understand it, we can make decisions about how to deal with it, how to intervene in that process in different kinds of ways whose outcomes we cannot predict, but whose outcomes have an opportunity to actually be progressive in the sense of fostering people's social, cultural, and you know, political lives. So that's what I'm doing now. Michelle, Horace, what do you say? Well, I, just to build on what you said, I mean, there's certainly, you know, there's, there's economic power, there's political power, there's many different kinds of power that converge into any kind of central system like this. And I guess one of the pleasures of doing history for me is to find those places where no matter what the dominant prevailing forces might be that are encouraging things to go in one direction, the amazing things that people can do, people in organizations to produce you know, programs, opportunities, uh, moments, uh, structures where something different can be done. And you never know where they're going to crop up. Um, I just want to have a little shout out here to uh, Frida Hennock. <laughs> I like her name, too. Um, who was the first female FCC commissioner you might know and who really got, you know, the, um, the uh, FM set-asides had been there but got the television set-asides for a public and educational TV. You wouldn't have thought she would have done that. Boy, did she get dumped on by her fellow commissioners and, you know, treated as a dotty woman. Um, but, uh, and, you know, she was not radical or anything like that. But, you know, there's an example of somebody who did something just at the right moment in time. And there's so many, um, I guess I'm being the Pollyanna here, but, you know, so many mm -hmm. moments in history that are sort of inspiring like that. The only thing I would add uh, to your question, Augie, is, is by way of an attempt uh, response, is that um, I think we may, and, and here I'm, I'm probably too, um, I, I'm going out on a limb of a futurist as opposed to a historian. Neither limb is strong enough for me. But uh, I think we may be at one of those moments. I, I think there's, an, there's enough uh, confusion now, uh, an, enough innovation on the one hand, or, or let's call it experimentation, or let's call it guessing, uh, uh, the, that the industries, uh, the, the interlock of industries and policy and economics is, uh, is a little fragile at the moment. Uh, the, uh, if, in fact, uh, the, uh, the current FCC is able to push through some form of spectrum auction return of, and, and so on, you know, what, what does that mean? The broadcasters are fighting it, uh, but the, the commissioner uh, wants, wants it there. Um, it's part of a larger policy. But would it work? Would it make things, would it really increase broadband in, in a way that would make a change? But I think, the, I think a lot of people in the, in the industries, certainly on the entertainment side, um, are, are a little scared. They don't know what to do exactly. They're watching the rise of, of the cable services. They're watching, uh, frankly, uh, they're watching the cable shows uh, take more prizes, like Emmys and Peabody's. Uh, and they don't know exactly what's happening with some of their own creative community. The numbers are changing in terms of audience, but the numbers are changing in, in the amount of money that's put into shows. Uh, until you get a hit, uh, you can, you know, Breaking uh, the Walking Dead suddenly costs more money to produce. Uh, Frank Darabont gets fired or moves out or quits or whatever story you believe. Um, uh, because the, you, you're going to have a rise in cost in production. And, and so everybody on the one hand wants a hit, but they fear a hit because they gotta pay those actors. Uh, and, and you know, the, the, the whole process is, is fragile at the moment. And it will be interesting to see what happens, uh, particularly with user-generated content on YouTube and, and the whole thing of YouTube starting these channels. And, and uh, uh, it, it's just a strange moment. I'm, 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 I'm kinda glad to be winding down. It's a, it's a, <laughs> I wanted to ask all three presenters about, um, obviously radio has been brought up as a predecessor of television, but what about the larger question that seems to be quite often overlooked in television studies of television's relationship to other media? I would throw out perhaps we can think of early television as not just uh, radio with pictures, but illustrated telephony 
or television's relationship to the cinema, um, television studies and film studies remaining mostly on separate tracks, uh, just ones that are not largely in dialogue with one another, um, uh, television's relationship to home stereo, things like that. I wonder if uh, all, you know, any of you, all three of you, could speak to that sort of concern. Michelle, you want to start with well, I feel like I've spent my entire career dancing on these edges, you know, between uh, cinema and uh, broadcasting and radio and TV. And um, yeah, it's interesting how um, these divisions remain in place in scholarship. I mean, you know, this is, it's a scholarship question, right? Because people use these media completely across all of these platforms. Um, and it, it's interesting that, you know, we're now in this, uh, we've been talking about so many trans media uh, experiences where, you know, we can't even talk about an isolated text because the text moves across, you know, all of these different media. So I feel like, you know, you'd, you'd think scholars would notice that, and we are, I mean, you know, we, we have. Um, but you're right, there are these unexplored um, avenues of, of interaction. And I think, you know, I'll, I'll harp on sound again, but, you know, there's been people um, uh, recently uh, talking a lot about, you know, music, or especially popular music and sound, it's a medium. We ought to be studying that in our communication departments, in our media departments, and we still tend not to. And, you know, the musicology departments, they're taking on a little bit, but they're not really interested in the media. And that's a, it's amazing to me that we don't have popular music and sound more integrated into our uh, curricula. But, you know, I think, I think we will in, in years to come. Still an optimist. I, I would just say you defined a very fine research mm -hmm. agenda. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> the, the, there's a lot to be done, and, uh, and, and get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I kind of have two answers. Um, one is, again, to just reiterate the point about academics. Uh, the kinds of institutional walls that you see between different groups of people who are supposed to be studying things that are intimately connected to each other is ridiculous. You know, the Society for Cinema Studies becomes, when they realize television's out there, the Society for Cinema and Media Studies. Thank God, cinema is not a medium. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think the change comes from scholars, not from organizations and not from the way that departments are organized. Departments eventually are forced to realize that life has changed and they need to reorganize their visions. And that largely comes from the people who come in and keep telling folks, you know, it's all changed and we need to think about things like music in the movies and, you know, broadcast TV, think cable, you know? It's the coming thing, it's 2000. Cable could make it. Uh, when we think about these industries and how they're presented to us in the media, how they're presented to us in the news, uh, and how spokespeople for these organizations present the media. We are told that there is film and TV, broadcast and cable. Uh, there is the internet and Google. There are all these different things. There's recorded music, totally different. All these different kinds of media out there. And so is journalism doing well or is music doing well? Da 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 da. When you look at th them through the lens of political economy, you see a very different kind of world. There are many different technologies of communication. There are many different forms of media. Uh, and historically, there have been different kinds of ways that companies in you know, private systems have carved those up. Right now, we're looking at what? Six, seven, eight? I don't keep losing track. They go up, they go down. Six, seven, eight major corporations that control almost every type of media operation that they could operating on a global basis. Uh, and when you think about the really big and important ones like General Electric, which control huge portions of economic sectors across multiple national economies, never mind the global economy, say global finance, uh, global manufacturing, transportation, global energy resources. We talk about companies like GE, we're talking about extraordinarily important fir firms, much more important than News Corporation, Disney, Time Warner, or any of those little companies that only own operations in multiple s industries in one sector. Getting our head around this is important because once we can recognize the disconnect between the industrial structures that are emerging and that we've seen over the last 30 years 
and the way that we talk about media, um, then we can begin to make some you know, creative insights about how to deal with the multiplicity of media versus the very small minority of owners. And I think for people who are you know, creative are already starting to do this because they're re they know that they want to be on every platform. Uh, and so they're already, you know, and already have been organizing their lives not to think about I'm a TV major or I'm a radio major or I'm a cinema major or I'm a photography major, I'm a journalism major. They're thinking I'm a media major, I'm a creator, period. I don't care what the technology is, I create. And if we can swing our minds around to that and balance the creative vision, the, you know, the technological realities, and the current economic structures and their political supports, then I think we might be able to push some of these folks in departments of black and white silent film that were only shown on three screens in Latvia. It's kind of into the, at least the 20th century. <laughs> I, I would add, by the way, that, that there is some very fine work that does that some of the kinds of things you do. I mean, Chris Anderson's book on Hollywood TV, yeah. uh, uh, the Tino Valio's work, uh, Lynn Spiegel's most recent book on, on television and, and the rise of modern art, I think is just an outstanding piece of work. And I, and I think that there more and more people are seeing that these connections are there, particularly about, the, uh, given the, the way television uh, in some ways reorganized personal life. And, and I think that, that's, uh, that there are plenty of things that, that, that will be done and have been done. And just to add on, um, if you've been following the Consoling Passions Conference, uh, a lot of folks there who are coming in, whether they're coming from the cultural studies side or they're coming from the political economy side, they just don't see those separations mm -hmm. that we grew up with. Um, I've got a question for Michelle. I, I tend to agree with you, and in fact my paper at this conference indicates that I agree with you, that contemporary television looks an awful lot like radio. Um, and I'm, I'm curious if you have any speculation on why that is. Is it that, is it comforting with all, amidst all this change, let's just go back to what worked, you know, 80 <laughs> years ago? Or um, I, I'm just curious about what you, what you think about the reason for that mm -hmm. sort of return to radio. I, think, I guess I'd like to, see, uh, to, to think about that in relationship to, you know, what we think of as not radio, which is the period of network television that it was it, the most, the, what I've called the classic network system, the most concentrated, centralized manja. That was an aberration. And that was not by chance, although technology had something to do with it. But, you know, just put this in the context that it happened. This was the Cold War. This was consolidation. This was a political decision. We know that. Uh, and it's interesting um, that, you know, so, so we get these very rigid, you know, centralized structures that hold things in place for economic and political reasons. You know, around the world, as television is rolling out, that's what it rolls out into, you know, that particular um, historical moment. So I think that's the aberration, and the weird thing is, okay, so that's when television rolls out as a, as a extension of broadcasting. That's when media study enters the university and we start thinking about these things. That's when the first books about television appear. So we have that, you know, it's so central, you know, that, not, who was it uh, who spoke earlier, the three uh, networks structure, you turn on your television and you have, you know, three choices. Um, but that's the aberration, like so many things. I, I mean, some of them good, some of them bad during that particular period of the 20th century, I think. So I think we're going back to a model that is much uh, like uh, the, the dispersed media models across media, not just radio, but print and uh, music and things that existed before. Um, my question's also, Michelle, um, and I was actually gonna ask the same question, <laughs> but um, if I could just follow up. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that in the like new media press, there's a lot of talk about returning to early television. Um, there was a really great headline in Ad Age a couple months ago, Facebook ad exec, we're like television 1951, <laughs> right? Which is, why, why do that? Um, and I'm wondering if actually the dispersed distribution issue is exactly what's going on, that yeah. there's a kind of nostalgia for the three network model where companies could make tons of money without having to do very much. Um, <laughs> and so I'm wondering if you think that's also true, and if so, is there a way to envision a robust economy for radio like today, where there's dispersed mm -hmm. distribution, but also tons of people can kind of make a living. Yes, you, you put your finger right on the weakness of the new sound uh, innovation explosion is that everybody's working for little public radio stations and they're making you know a pittance. 
Uh, some people are doing okay, like Ira Glass, but uh, you know, there's a, <laughs> he's a minor, uh, 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 just unique, I guess. Um, yeah, I wonder, I mean, I don't know what context that ad was in, but uh, certainly we're returning to the sponsored program, you know, it was that, I don't know if it was about that, but I've seen some other, we, uh, in fact, somebody was talking about that earlier today, I wish I could remember exactly who, um, you know, the return to the integrated advertising, single sponsor model of TV, and also the early 50s, of course, were a lot more dispersed, you know, than it became in the 60s. But I, I you know, I would say, y you're probably right, I mean, we have this image of, uh, what is it, uh, well, it was in England where, um, oh, one of the, my fellow historians can help me out here. Who was it that said a TV license is a license to print money? That was, who was that? I don't think it was Thompson. That's who it was. During, yeah, it was, uh, he was actually, he was becoming a wealthy in uh, Britain's introduction of commercial television in the mid-1950s. And it was. So that's a very interesting hypothesis. I tend to agree with you. There was a statistic earlier today that I think the average American spends 160 hours a month with television, and we know that going back through the 60s, people have spent upwards of four hours per day watching television. Um, Dallas Smythe quipped in the context of, the, of China's cultural revolution that time spent attending to individualist pursuits is time not spent overthrowing capital of capitalism. That's kind of an extreme example. I think uh, we can. Harold Dennis probably put the question better when he asked, why do we attend to the things to which we attend to? And I'm wondering, looking back over the history of television, how can we look at that question and think about television as a cultural, social, and economic institution in terms of what we have attended to in the capitalist world, spending almost a full week's work with television in addition to the work we do in remuner remunerated jobs? Mm -hmm. Why do, why do we play? <laughs> yeah, we, we play because we have to. Uh, and now the, the, uh, the, the organization of that play by uh, these or the, the, the uh, television producers, network systems, whatever, um, is, a, is a problem. And, and we study that as a problem. We attend to it in that way. I study television. I, I attend to television. I, I probably watch Counting the news, I probably watch uh, three hours of television a day. Uh, that doesn't count the Golf Channel on Saturday, <laughs> uh, uh, depending on what the uh, tournament is. Um, uh, and and I find something I important in all of that. You know, I, 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 I when Graham Turner was talking this morning, I realized uh, with with his comments about uh, the anthropology uh, colleague that he has that that in I used, my, de my degree is in American literature. I never had a communication course. I, I never, you know, wanted to do that. There weren't any where I was. And uh, outside of the fact that I was on the debate team and had an entire semester devoted to the study of Robert's Rules of Order. Um, <laughs> but uh, I've just, you know, for me, it's about the study of culture. And the, the way I study American culture uh, is through television. And I, I have no reason to apologize or worry about uh, the, the, what I take as the rather harsh notions of Smythe and Ennis. I want to come at this from a kind of different direction, Lee. Um, I don't trust the numbers. Any numbers that we get from Nielsen or similar kinds of firms are rooted in the, those companies' self-interest. And one of the things when we look at the way the ratings processes are designed, and I won't say measurements, processes are designed, they're designed to balance uh, the advertiser's demand for the right kinds of eyeballs and the, uh, you know, the venues, the cable channels and the TV uh, channels, demand, their demand to get as much money as they can from the advertisers. So you know, the big numbers are the right kind of eyeballs. And as, as ratings companies, yeah, you know, the different monopolists have kind of worked that out, you know, balancing, you know, giving this side a concession and that side a concession. But one of the things that's most interesting to me about Nielsen is the degree to which uh, the main numbers that they collect and count don't really measure viewing. 
uh, in the old meters, if the set was on, <laughs> you were viewing. <laughs> you know, uh, now with the people meters, you've got to fool around with the little, you know, hit the button thing. But if you hit the button and you leave, you're viewing. Uh, and then there are things like the Surgeon General's report on television from I think it was the late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, and one of the studies in there, very old fashioned, they rigged up a 16 millimeter film camera in you know, the living rooms of these households and it would run and I can't imagine the, the difficulties involved technically. But one of the things they found was that the television was frequently on and no one was in the room. <laughs> you know, it's like Saturday morning, children's TV. Yes, there are the, oh, great shot. There are the children and the TV's on. Then boom, they're out of there. And they run through and they throw things and they yell. But are they viewing? Uh, I think of my own habits, you know, go home from school, start to cook, turn on the TV, do the New York Times crossword puzzle, talk to a friend on the telephone, uh, and correct papers. Am I viewing? Um, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that can be done looking at what people actually do with these <laughs> media. And when you think about households with more than one television set constantly on, and music constantly playing, and computers constantly on, that's a whole different kind of electronic uh, media scape in the home than the ones that get measured and that get talked about when we talk about viewing and audiences. And I think there's a real disconnect there. But you know, we need to develop the data to see if that exists or not. And we're certainly not gonna come from any commercial organization, not in their interest. So I, I guess I've got more hope. I'm on the shell side on this one. I hope that people aren't viewing. I hope the numbers are wrong. <laughs> Well, just to reply cynically, I mean, why don't you ever hear this about reading? Oh my God, four hours spent reading is a time you're not out, you know. <laughs> and, you know, obesity caused by reading, you know, it is a sedentary activity, you know, you never hear these things, you know. Well, so that ought to say something about television as an object. Yeah. I just, I had one, I wanted to, I got very excited by something Eileen said. Um, because it made me think very differently about media history. I, hear, I heard part of what you were saying is that we need a kind of integrative approach to understanding media history rather than the way that we've studied and trained our students to be either you know, historians of film or cinema, that each time a new medium enters the field, mm -hmm. you see these massive kinds of reorganization. So rather than trying to map out this genealogy of distinction, which you know, people do all the time now with new media, right? Lev Manovich says it's cinema, right? New media comes from cinema. Other people want to stake out TV or radio. Um, so I'm wondering if you could say something about also the future of how we teach media studies and communication in that context, because it, it seems a really opportune moment to think about that. <laughs> how are we gonna teach this stuff? Especially when people have got their pods in, and their phones on, and they're checking their email, and yeah, you know, they've got the computer open, but you know, in that auditorium, you don't really know what they've got on the screen. Uh, you ooh, got a good guess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you have a good guess that it's not <laughs> what we're doing. <laughs> so how do we teach it? Uh, that's. That's the million dollar question. And it's a matter of opening our minds up and thinking larger and getting input from people whose immediate experience of media is in this multiple outlet, multiple technology kind of system as opposed to sitting in front of the TV and dad decides what you're gonna watch. <laughs> and there is only one TV in the house and it weighs about 5,000 pounds. <laughs> Do you have an answer?
taking spare time to dinner or to eat something in the cottage to heat up and then you go in the back and you take your evening shower or you can walk the dog. The thing is still on, you're still battling or now they're making it night on or, or with the heat. So how do you measure active consumption versus vomiting and being a little bit? Yeah, and is consumption the right way to approach this issue at all? Um, thank, thank you. Um, I'm, we're at time, and I'd like to thank you for your comments and thanks. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. It connects yeah. the two's experience yeah. of the artifacts, too. Yeah. Yeah.